Greetings respected viewers, I'm George from Ireland. Um, here I am in Edinburgh in front of this um, fabulous classical statue of William Ewart Gladstone. Um, a figure who had very strong associations with Edinburgh, though he wasn't born here and never lived here. So uh, Gladstone is best known for having served as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom on four occasions. Um, and here we are in the new town of Edinburgh, as in this, this crescent finished in 1825. And the statue of him was, was um, put up in um, 1902, that's just four years after his death, but uh, not in this location, it was put up in St Andrew's Square. Um, although it wasn't actually erected until 1917, so during the, during the First World War, the Earl of Rosebery, another former Liberal Prime Minister, unveiled it, moved to this spot um, in 1955. So, um, Gladstone, there he is in the robes of, I think, of the Chancellor of the University. He was Chancellor of Oxford University, if memory doesn't play me false. So, he was born in Liverpool in 1809, and his father, Sir John Gladstone, was an extraordinarily wealthy businessman. Um, and and uh, his, his Sir John Gladstone's, and it was an S on the end, um, had been born in Lee, which is the port of Edinburgh. Um, he'd been apprenticed to a merchant when he was quite young. The, the surname Gladstone was originally Gladstone because there was, a, there was a village that they came from several generations before. So uh, Sir John Gladstone, he traded with the Baltic and he'd obviously he traded in, in the West Indies. So um, he made his wealth through owning thousands of members of our own species. Um, yes, slavery. Some of the Gladstone family do not like to be reminded of these days. They're still going. There's a Xenophon Gladstone, who's born about 1972, knocking around somewhere, a direct descendant of the PM. Uh, anyway, what else about um, this, uh, this family? So, uh, and actually, William Ewart Gladstone, this man here, when, um, he, uh, when he went into Parliament, one of the hottest topics of debate was whether slavery ought to be done away with. And um, he was a zealous advocate of maintaining slavery. Okay, obviously slavery was then abolished and um, he accepted that and later came to believe it was evil and should be... should be outlawed throughout the globe. And that was one of the main drivers behind imperialism, to emancipate those who were held in thraldom. Uh, and when, when, indeed, when slavery was abolished, uh, lots of money was paid out, huge amounts of compensation to the owners, not to the victims of slavery. Over 20 million pounds, a huge sum at the time, in 1833. And the Gladstone family was the largest single recipient of, of compensation, which why people in Trinidad and the Bahamas and so forth sometimes had the surname Gladstone. Um, anyway, so Gladstone's one of several children. He went to Eton. He later went to Christchurch, Oxford, one of the grandest colleges in Oxford at the time. You didn't all arrive in October back then. You actually arrived in December, and you didn't necessarily finish the same month of the year but his, his education is mostly about the classics. So he was a very notable classical scholar. Um, and um, and he, he, he was the author of several books, the most outstanding intellectual has ever served as prime minister. Um, so there's some quotations from the Iliad here. Um, and I'm, I'm actually rubbish at age degree, but I'll try reading it for you. So you see there, um, oi peri me prof ro roi um, kradie kai for thumos agi agio as in um a man whose um heart and spirit ex uh, excel others something like that um well more virtuous more more virile and virtuous something like that and take this one here okay um tokai apo um glossios me melikos melitos um gluki glukie rie um and aude pretty rubbish or so um whose um tongue flowed from whose tongue flowed words sweeter than honey um so you might if you've seen the glossa bit in that as in tongue or language in ancient greek gives the word glossary um so tongues flowing like honey well mellifluous would say but that would be latin not Greek. Um, and so he's got these various figures here to depict the things that he was into. Um, who is this learned lady holding the book? I'm not sure. And a look at this one here. Oh, fortitude she's labelled. That's what she represents. Um, and you see she's holding a shield and there's the image of the face of Jesus Christ on it, bearing the crown of horns. Look at these waves. They're quite nude. Um, there are no, no fig leaves there. Wouldn't be allowed these days. Is that to poverty help them? 
and these, these, these birds here, they're known as gleds, the species of kite, an allusion to gleds stain, his home village, with little gleds around there. And look at this, this laurel wreath of victory. Um, okay, and this um, lady here is eloquentia, as in um, speaking in a very articulate fashion, because he was such a notable orator. Of course, it was a time when, when actually speaking to crowds really mattered, protecting your voice because there was no public address system. But obviously not many people had the right to vote. So he went up to Oxford, he's great friends with um, the, the um, I think it was the Earl of, uh, where was it? Was it the Earl of Nottingham? Or the Earl of, uh, anyway, because his father was the Duke of Newcastle, I've got that right. And um, he was a complete obscurantist, was, was um, uh, glad. So we now regard him as a reactionary, saying that the great, the great Reform Act shouldn't pass, there should be no Catholic emancipation and blah, 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 so that only a tiny number of people, the property classes, should be allowed to vote. Nevertheless, he wasn't noble himself. And uh, people said, Oxford on top, but Liverpool underneath. He was a scouse. And the house where he was born on Arnold Street still stands. He wasn't the eldest son in his family. Robertson was, so his elder brother Robertson inherited the, the, the baronetcy. Um, and William Hugh Gladstone, who was very proud that all his ancestors and ancestresses, as far back as could be traced, were entirely of North British stock. Um, anyway, so uh, then he was elected to Parliament for a pocket borough that his friend and aristocrat made sure that he got, as in uh, 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 constituency with, um, which was completely controlled by an aristocrat who could sack or, or evict anyone who didn't vote his way. So um, uh, Gladstone was there. Did he, did he sit for Newark first of all? He sat for a number of different constituencies. He was born in 1809, by the way. Oh, look at Vitality, holding the lamp of light, life up there, this lady here. Um, he eventually represented Midlothian, which is as in the area around Edinburgh. Um, the famously, there was the Midlothian campaign and this one's Faith, where she's holding the, the Holy Bible. Um, and he was um, fascinated by ecclesiology and he published a book on the relations between the church and state and things like that, and uh, what role the religion should play in, 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 in um, uh, education. Famously, he resigned over the new Main Youth Grant, almost had a nervous breakdown of it. Obviously, the, the, the government had been um, subsidizing Main Youth as a seminary in Ireland, and um, he was against Catholicism, but then there was a good proposal to increase it and to give more money to the Catholic Church. And could he unconscious do, do this? He decided that he couldn't, but that's obviously jumping ahead. So he was a Tory and described it as the sterning hope of the, uh, sorry, the rising hope of the stern and bending Tories, but he was later to change his tune. And then famously in 1846, um, he crossed the floor. He and Sir Robert Peel, the Prime Minister, they split from the Tory party, or the Conservative party as it had become by then, over the Corn Laws. And he was, he was um, a Peelite for a while, saying, um, uh, we should no longer tax the importation of corn, just let the market regulate it. And this is really the beginnings of um, sort of free trade and economics being an article of faith for the Liberal Party. Well, the Liberal Party, as such, wasn't founded at the time. Um, not at all. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to think, 1861, if I've got that right. So, then the Earl of Aberdeen was Prime Minister later on, and he served in his cabinet. Now, Lord Aberdeen was the only Peelite Prime Minister. Some people sometimes count as a Liberal, it's not strictly true because Peelites were well served under him as in former Conservatives and um, uh, Whigs served under him but they hadn't actually merged together from the Liberal Party until a little bit later. But uh, um, Gladstone was then one of the lares ac penates of, of, of um, liberalism all around the world and classical liberalism to this day. Someone like Margaret Thatcher would have viewed herself as a classical liberal. Um, so what else about Gladstone? So he had a house at Harden in Wales. I know it's pronounced Hawarden. So I just felt Hawarden but called that of flying the hardened kite if he's coming up with ideas. I wonder if that's a reference to his the, the Gled part of his surname as well. Um, he'd been Chancellor of Exchequer. He sometimes served as his own Chancellor of Exchequer when he was Prime Minister. He's an absolute workaholic. He wrote an incredibly detailed diary. And you know who he sat beside at lunch and what they discussed and how many lines of um, the Iliad he read. Those are two quotations from the Iliad, as in the, book, the, 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 the um, poem that um, Homer supposedly composed about the Trojan Wars, because Ilium is the other name for, for um, Tro Troy, is this the face that launched a thousand ships and set of flame the topless towers of Ilium? Um, as is in Christopher Marlowe wrote that. So, and then the Odyssey, which is the attempt to come to, to, to voyage back from Ilium to, to, to Greece, as in Odysseus going on that. Um, so he was often, he was always construing Greek and Latin into English, but uh, he kept his iron world affairs, well, especially Western Europe and Amer American affairs, 
That's why he voyaged around Denmark and Norway. And in the 1880s, that summer holiday, that's when he thought that home rule for Ireland would be a good idea, that he thought it seemed to have worked for Norway, which is then part of the um, Kingdom of Sweden. But uh, as we know, that actually didn't pan out. And only in 1905, Norway split completely and got a Danish prince to be king. So um, Gladson, he married at an early age to Catherine and they had several children. His sons followed into, into, into Parliament, Herbert. Herbert's the famous one who spilled the, t the beans of the times. But Gladson, who had actually set his face against home rule for Ireland, then came round to it. And obviously then tried to bring it in in 1885, failed 1886 election. Liberals lost to the Conservatives. Uh, a large chunk of the Liberal Party decamped Liberal Unionists formed an alliance with the Conservative Party and eventually amalgamated into them about the, about the First World War. So some of Gladstone's grandsons were also um, members of Parliament, one of them was killed in the First World War. But after that, the, the Gladstone family no longer played a prominent role in politics. So the grand old man, as they called him, but of course he'd failed to save General Chinese Gordon in, in, in Sudan, but Gordon was there working for the Khedive of Egypt, not for the United Kingdom. So why should Gladstone bail him out? So he'd failed to rescue Gordon, so the grand old man, G-O-M, became M-O-G, murderer of Gordon at Khartoum, you know, in, in, in Sudan. See, um, whatever, is it Gordon of Khartoum, that 1970s film with, with Charlton Heston in the title role. Um, so Gladson, uh, yeah, he was often he was preoccupied with Irish affairs for quite some time, partly because of the Clerkenwell explosion in London, when the Irish Republican Brotherhood, they set off a bomb outside a prison wall to try and rescue one of their comrades who was in jail, didn't work, managed to kill a dozen civilians. Um, so uh, that's when he, when he was informed that the Queen was inviting him to form uh, a government to be Prime Minister, he said, my mission is to pacify Ireland. Well, which he didn't really work, didn't manage to get through Home Rule. Eventually, 1893, it was got through the House of Commons, but the House of Lords blocked it. House of Lords could prevent things indefinitely in those days. So finally, 1894, he reti retired as Prime Minister for the fourth and last time, and the Earl of Rosebery, another old Tony Noxonian Scot, took over as Prime Minister. That's why um, it was a Rosebery History Prize when I was a schoolboy, I suppose named in honour of Lord Rosebery. Um, so that was him. He died in, in 18... Um, 98. Bear in mind, so he was Prime Minister till 1894, which was a very great age at the time, the age of 85. In the 19th century, 85 was well beyond life expectancy. Yeah, it'd be like being Prime Minister at the age of 110 these days. So um, uh, he was always trying to um, uh, help women turn away from prostitution, and he was a bit naive in this, picking up hookers and bringing them back to Downing Street, and, 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 and uh, someone quipped to him, uh, William, when you're out saving fallen women, save one for me because you can imagine what uh, his political enemies would make of this. They would say that he had a less than moral intention in bringing these ladies of the night back to 10 Downing Street. So he was treasurer, first Lord of the Treasury, that's the official title of Prime Minister until about 1908. Um, and he really did take an intense interest in the Treasury, totting things up, which is why he changed his mind over the Corn Laws so that economically it just was unsound. It was against, he was against graduated taxation, believing in a flat tax, wanted to get rid of income tax, just a 19th century, sorry, an 18th century innovation to pay off a war date that no one else, else quite managed to do away with. But his long-term objective was to um, end it, but uh, it did not, did not accomplish that. But candle ends and cheese pairings, he said, that's what it was all, all about. So he's also famous for eventually having um, um, proposed advancing um, the French franchise, widening it. And sometimes he'd oppose this. He tried to do it in the 1860s, um, although um, he wasn't PM when he did it, but the Conservatives blocked it. And the very next year, they brought in the Second Reform Act, which um, introduced a, a reform more extensive than the one which had been envisaged by the Liberals the year before, and that they blocked just to dish the Whigs, you know, just completely being partisan and seeking to gain advantage over the party opposite. So he'd often said that um, um, he's an out and out inegalitarian, wealth, birth, status or at least as important if not more important than any other virtues but later on the people's William he became known now saying I will always back the masses against the classes and I'm sure he would have pronounced it that way he might have had a mild Lancashire accent because speaking and received pronunciation didn't come till the till the early 20th century the advent of the BBC really so uh, that's probably that's probably enough about um, Gladstone and that Midlothian campaign which I mentioned was in the um, 
late 1870s when there had been a rebellion in Bulgaria, then part of the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire had put it down, to put it down with singular brutality. Now, I know um, uh, quelling a revolt um, is, is never done non-violently, uh, but this is really just with an exceptional degree of violence, not simply killing ins insurgents in battle, you'd expect that, but killing huge numbers of civilians. And the thing is, Disraeli was Prime Minister at the time, the Earl of Beaconsfield, uh, followed Tory policy, which was to prop up the Ottoman Empire because the, the Caliph um, would tell the, the Muslims all over the world to be loyal to the British. But, but Gladstone said this is immoral. We cannot countenance this um, um, grossly unconscionable policy that the Ottomans are pursuing in Bulgaria. So he then published a pamphlet, The um, Bulgarian Horrors and the Question of the East. And he um, campaigned for re-election here at a by-election. And really, he set the world ablaze with that. So, but uh, Gladstone was, was, was not someone who didn't manage to impress Disraeli. They loathed each other. And uh, Disraeli said, I haven't let, read a line of this row. But yeah, so Gladstone came back as an MP and Prime Minister the next year, 1880. Well, Disraeli then fell very ill and he died in 1881. Um, and, 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 and Gladstone said he was too busy to attend the man's funeral, which is obviously the, the, the final insult, the snub to the squire of Hewenden. Anyway, I could go on all day about uh, William Ewart Gladstone, the most consequential figure, someone um, who was obviously studied in great depth at A-level by many, many people scintillating, rather humorless. They don't make them like that anymore.